Trashomaniacs. Welcome back to episode 187 of the Geo Gearheads. I'm Daryl W4 with the Bad Cop, as usual. But we have a very special guest this week to talk about uh, gadget caches. Definitely, and we can we can't talk about gadget caches without bringing this fellow on board, and that would be WV Tim. Now he was with us way back, Daryl. Do you remember when we still had the beta tag? Uh, all too well. Uh, so way back it was Geo Gearheads Beta 41, and we called it Gadget Caches with WV Tim. So WV Tim, thanks for being with us tonight. Hey, thanks guys for having me. Now, you've done some things since we've talked to you last. Uh, I want to say that it could be a lot of your caches have been found recently. There was a there was a little event in your area, wasn't there? Yeah, you talking about the meet and greet at the uh, Domino's Pizza or uh, Geo Woodstock? I was thinking more Geo Woodstock. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, Geo Woodstock was just across the border in Maryland, which is probably only you know less than thirty minutes from me. Mm -hmm. So, did you get a lot of finds and favorite points on your gadget caches? Oh wow! I, I, you know, I was so surprised, honestly. I kind of blocked out that whole week after Geo Woodstock telling my wife that I'll, buy, I'll be doing cash maintenance because, of course, with my gadget caches, stuff moves. And people told me nightmares about going to other mega events and all the damage that was done to geocaches. So I was just preparing myself just to go out, had my tools already loaded in the truck. I figured Monday morning I'm going to be doing nothing but cash maintenance. Monday morning came along. I went to geocaching.com, went to my profile hit my caches thinking that I would see a line of red, you know, wrenches because I had over 10,000 emails. So wow. there was no way I could read through my emails that morning and find out how many, you know, maintenance problems I had. And I looked through, I have about, right now, about 80 active caches. I had one law, I had one cache that had a maintenance note. And that was an etch -a sketch that had been out for two years and it died. And so, really, I was, people really were just so amazingly nice and gentle with my gadget caches. I, I was just blown away with the whole geocaching community. They were just, just fabulous. And so, I had great logs and uh, they treated them gently. And uh, so, um, Really, Monday morning rolled around. Kind of, it was an uneventful, uneventful day. <laughs> well, that's not always a bad thing. No, that that was good. <laughs> what what I was expecting. So then I went to reading logs, and of course I got my fair share of uh, TFTCs. Mm -hmm. uh, but the majority of my logs were just exceptional, and so I spent the next week reading every single one of my logs because I figured if people went to the the trouble of writing a great log. The least I could do is read it. So I had the best week. I just uh, sit there and and every time I get a chance, I just sit there with the iPad and an easy chair and just read them. And some of the logs, you know how you know what a good log looks like. And some of them, you just felt like you were right there with the cashier and you know just kind of experience it with them. And I, it was it was a, I had a great time. I had a great time. Oh, how nice. Now, Tim, you say you have 80 current caches out there, 80 active caches? Yeah, I'm somewhere in the 80s, okay. active caches. I think I put out a little over 200, but um, when I first started putting caches out, you know, just like everybody else, I, I wanted to um, highlight a bike trail here in, um, in the eastern Panhandle, West Virginia, and we have a Tuscarora Trail, which is kind of um, the sister to the Appalachian Trail. So mm -hmm. I put a lot of caches out. 
that were pretty much just Tupperware. And uh, now other cachers have kind of, you know, started putting out caches on both those trails. So I've been able to archive a lot of my caches and give room for other cachers to come along. So, I, yeah, I'm somewhere probably in that 80, 90 kind of time, you know, um, range of active caches. Nice. And probably, uh, not, and not all those are gadgets, probably, I don't know, I've never really looked and counted, but probably 30, 40, probably 40 of them are gadgets. Okay, so about half of what and you have. Yeah, probably half. Now, not only do you make these caches, but you also have a YouTube channel to show people how the caches work on the inside. Am I yeah, right? That's, so, that's true. So the geocache builders can get some inspiration? Yes. Now, yeah, go ahead. I don't know if you know, but that was the question for this week's show and a chance to win a prize from coinsandpins.com. So, Tim, what's the name of your YouTube channel and the lucky geo gearhead that was randomly selected to be this uh, the, week's winner? Uh, the name of my channel is Gadget Caches, and the lucky winner is Seven Iron. <laughs> That's right. So congratulations, Seven Iron. Seven Iron must be a golfer as well as a geocacher. And you know, you know, just throwing out the connection of the Northwest and golfing, I don't know if you saw, but the U.S. Open was right here in my backyard this year. So there were seven days with Super Bowl-like attendance in the area. So I avoid, tried to avoid all restaurants, all highways, and uh, hunker down and pretend you know, I didn't see the blimp going by over, overhead every day. But uh, congratulations, Seven Iron, and thank you, CoinsAndPins.com, for that wonderful prize. Now, we're going to have another chance to win at the end of this show, so make sure you stay with us through that. But uh, we've received some information about another contest with great prizes, haven't we, Daryl? We did, and fellow Geo Gearheads, uh, former guest and Open Caching North America admin, Dudley Grunt, emailed us about a contest they're brewing up over at OCNA. August 18th is the 5th anniversary of a North American site, so for the entire month of August, you can earn points against 36 actions for a chance at a variety of prizes. And we'll link to their blog post so you can find out more and get started earning those points. Now, we do have some uh, stuff in the uh, live Q&A here, and the first one I think we probably want to tackle actually comes from uh, someone by the name of uh, W.V. Tim, and he wants to know, what is a gadget cache? <laughs> So, Tim, are you willing to answer your own question? Well, I don't know. I was kind of <laughs> anxious to hear what you all thought it was. <laughs> yeah, when I had uh, Joshua, uh, Joshua, the V-Vlogger, was out, and he accused me of um, uh, pinning that that title. And I said, well, I don't think I was the first to pin it or use it, but uh, I probably helped make it famous. So, yeah, I'd, uh, I'd be anxious to hear what you all think. I, I call it Gadget Cash. Any cache that you have to do something to be able to access the log. Um, it might be mechanical, it could be electrical, but you, you, when you get to the cache, you have to do something. So every one of my gadget caches, I check that field attribute, um, you know, field puzzle, uh, field yeah, puzzle right. attribute. So it's, I, I, think, I see a gadget cache as a cache when you get there, you have to do something. Unlike a puzzle I cache, where you've got a lot of times to do something before you get there. Exactly. And on a lot of puzzle caches, the, the actual, actual physical container isn't really at the stated coordinates. On a gadget cache, um, most of mine are at the stated coordinates, but after you get there, it, you know, finding mine's easy. It's uh, trying to get in and sign the log that's... Um, you know that's hard. In fact, I get you know I get logs. I've never deleted a log, but every once in a while I have I have one cache that's bright red and it's probably 18 inches tall, you know, foot wide. I mean, it's huge, just big, huge cache. So person says I get a log a couple weeks ago and says, well, I worked for an hour trying to figure out how to how to get into it. I never could, but thanks for the cache. And it was a found note. I mean, it was a found log. So they found the cache. They just didn't sign the log. <laughs> Yeah. No, I completely agree with you with your definition of a gadget cache. Um, unfortunately, gadget caches and puzzle caches share the same icon, uh, so people get confused. The idea is that you know there's a there's a puzzle you can do on the computer or you know on paper before you leave to get the coordinates. 
uh, as opposed to a puzzle you do once you find the uh, ground zero or the cache, and you have to figure out how to get that log, exactly as you said, how to get that log out and sign it, because if you don't sign the log, it's not a find. Well, you see, you're playing bad cop because <laughs> I, I, I don't necessarily share your opinion that it uses the same icon because okay. a lot of my gadget caches are traditionals. So because if you read the definition, now this is probably not one of those debatable things. If you read the definition, it says that a traditional cache is located at that, at that spot. A puzzle cache says, I think, or a mystery cache says a lot of times you have to do work to figure out how to solve that puzzle. So a lot of my gadget caches, most of my gadget caches, I make traditional because they're located right there. And I and now I've never asked HQ, but there is a there's that field attribute, you know, that attribute that says field puzzle. So I look at mine as traditional caches with field puzzles. But you know, um, because I don't want them to think that they have to do something before they get there. They can get there, and I love that field attribute puzzle because then they just got to solve it right there. Um, but that's that's a that's a, another one of those debatable questions. Um, you know, a reviewer one time suggested that mine become a puzzle, and I said, "Well, I really don't believe it's a puzzle. I believe it's traditional, but I have checked the field puzzle box um, because a lot of people just ignore puzzle caches." I'm one of those. I mean, that's the beauty of the game. The game is, you know, whatever you want to make it, and there are people who love puzzles. I'm just not one of those guys, although I make gadget caches. Um, I'm not a puzzle guy. So um, they say, you you know, you kind of build caches like you like to put out. Well, I, I don't want to solve puzzles, but I love going to a location trying to figure out what I've got to do to get in and sign that log. So I make a lot of mine traditionals. That is a really interesting take. You know what? I may take back what I said earlier. No, I'm the bad cop. I'm going to leave it the way it is. <laughs> well, I will say that uh, most of uh, Puzzlers 26's caches in this area are not listed as uh, unknown uh, types. They are listed as either a multi-cache in some cases or the uh, traditional for the very same reason. It's right where it says it is. You just have to go and figure it out. Or in some cases, it's a multi-stage gadget cache. Yes, and those those are easier to build, not easier to build. There's just a lot of opportunities to build multi gadget caches. Um, you know, but again, a lot of people don't like multis, and uh, but there are so many great gadget caches that are multis. Definitely. Now, Limax in the uh, live Q and A says that uh, using the definition that you just gave us. He's done uh, some gadget caches in his area, which I don't doubt because a lot of the ones that uh, f probably fall under gadget caches aren't even you know, called that by the owners. They're just uh, clever containers. You know, I, I don't know that I would uh, go quite as wide with the uh, gadget cache definition just because to me the gadget cache is a little bit uh, uh, different, a little bit more uh, playfulness than some of the just difficult puzzle caches. Well, yeah, and yeah, you might get a puzzler, uh, um, you know, disagree with you that, but because uh, there are some great puzzles out there too. That that's the beauty of this game. I mean, it has something for everybody, and it's you know whatever you like, it's got it. Absolutely, and you know the gadget caches to me just make it. Uh, uh, much more fun, and a lot of those are ones where it's that uh, destination cache that you can take people to and show them, this is why you want to get into geocaching. Look how cool this cache is, and look how much fun you can have. You know, it's not just going and finding that 35mm uh, film can in the lamp skirt. Yes, and I, I get a lot of logs. It's interesting. I get a lot of logs where the, either the husband or the wife has lost interest in caching, but the you know one of them will go find one of my gadget caches and then they drag their husband you know uh, from Connecticut or you know Michigan or wherever and they go well okay I want to take you down to West Virginia Tim's caches and they, so they'll come down and do some of my caches and I get a lot of logs or personal emails that says you you know my husband now is back enjoying geocaching because of finding your caches because uh, you know I think 
maybe and maybe uh, this is a big stereotype, but I think the older I get, the more I enjoy the gadget caches because when I'm geocaching with my grandson. Uh, he don't want to find a geocache. I mean, he wants an ammo can or he wants a big Tupperware with a lot of trinkets and trash in there. Um, but for me, as I get older, I'm not so much interested in the ammo cans or, you know, the Tupperware under a rock. What I'm really interested in is sitting there and, and, and being challenged to try to figure out how to open that cache. Um, so, um, but again, it's back to something for everybody. Well, this is really all about trying to get some inspiration to the Geo Gearheads and hopefully get them some uh, ideas to create their own gadget caches of any scale. But to start that off, Team Dano, or Dano of Team Pugash, rather, wants to know if you can uh, talk about the first gadget cra cache that you ever created. The uh, first gadget cache was a cache called High Tech. And. Um, I came up with this idea. It's very simple. You push in the perch, and when you push in the perch, the a micro comes out on a fishing line underneath the bottom, and it's actually on my channel. And believe it or not, that single cache, I came up with that idea. I was so proud of myself. I came up with this cache, and I made it out of old barn wood, and it just looked like it had been a birdhouse that had been sitting out in the woods for 50 years. And uh, but you tried to figure out what you've got to do, and I painted the, the, the back black, the bottom black, so you couldn't see the hole. I painted up in the hole dark, so you just couldn't figure out where this cache was. But when you push the perch in, the geocache came out of the bottom. Well, I leveraged what I did. I liked that idea so much. I started, uh, I picked states that were you know, way far away from me. And uh, you all know about my uh, friendship with Dayspring, um, uh, Peter. So I went all the way to Seattle. And so I saw this guy named Dayspring, and I said, hey, so I wrote this email. I go, hey, I got a great idea on a gadget cache. And here's a picture of it, and here's how I made it work. Would you mind sharing with me one of your ideas on one of your great caches? And so we started an exchange of ideas. And so I did that that same one with I even went to English speaking countries and I would I'd go search on the highest favorited cache in that country and then I would send them a note and say and I wouldn't ask them I, I mean I, I would just send them my all my information here's a picture of my cache here's how it works on the inside here's how you do it here's how it's designed it's really unique would you mind sharing me with me an idea and so that one single cache really kind of got me started building other caches and exchanging ideas because clearly, you know, I'm not very smart. If you knew me, uh, you know, you would you would be uh, you would clearly not be impressed. Uh, I have one thing available, and that's I'm retired now, and I have time <laughs> that I can build caches. And so in the in the winter, as soon as it gets uh, snow starts flying here in West Virginia, I kind of lock myself into my shop, and that's when I build my caches. Because right now I only put out caches twice a year. I mean, once a year, and that's around the my geo trail that I'm working with my local county. And so I only put caches out one day a year. I mean, they all come active, and I do that, you know, once a year. But uh, that one cache really helped get me started, and it got me exchanging ideas with geocachers all over the country. How cool. Just to let you know, uh, I think it was two weeks ago now, I went and did a couple of the day spring caches up in Seattle. I thought, I'm this close. I've got to go get them. So I set some time aside. Wits End and I went up and did some of the uh, totally tubular caches, and they're fantastic. You really do need to go visit those. They really are, and he's a great guy too. But smart, smart as a tack. But uh, he's got some great caches. I love sitting down with him, and we've had the opportunity to do it a couple times. And uh, you know, I I love exchanging ideas with other cachers. And that's the whole reason for my gadget cache. I mean, really, it's about improving the game. And I tell people all the time. Um, you know, I exchange ideas or people watch my gadget cache. And in fact, just tonight when I come up here to the computer, I was probably answering a half dozen emails. You know, how do you do this? 
um, you know, they had a question they saw on one of my gadget caches, you know, it says, how do you get that picture on the side of your gadget cache? You know, so it's a Mod Podge, for example. Another person saying, I can't find the lock that you referred to in your video. Where can I find it? So I'm answering questions all the time. Um, but I really ask that cache, the cachers don't give me credit because I think the space on the cache page is so, uh, you know, um, so important. You know, who cares if you live in Seattle if you got the idea from some guy in West Virginia uh, that they've never heard of? Uh, you just take the idea or the concept and run with it. It's just all about improving the game. And that's what I love doing is just trying to share ideas with other folks. What they say, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Yeah, so, yeah, um, yeah I, I'm, I'm just happy that people take my concepts and see them worthwhile to copy. Well, and really it's not that you're looking to have people copy it. You're trying to inspire them so that they take it and make it their own. You, you don't have the plans out there, okay, measure this, make this this size. It's all about here's what I did, go and make this and create your own version. Yeah, that's true, Daryl. And, you know, the thing about it, that it, it's, it's so amazing. So many pictures that people send me are better, far better than my caches. You know, I had this great brainstorm. I'm so proud of it, and I put it together. But if somebody can share a concept with you, and then you take that concept and run with it, uh, so many of the uh, – you know the the copies of my cache are done better. Uh, you know they're they're just so 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 some of the work is just so good. So I just I love it when they take the concept. Now I don't care if they want to copy my cache exactly. It's really weird. You get two different types of audiences. You know one audience is can you give me these measurements? And they want it exactly. And then some people just take the concept, and then when they send me the cash, they go, "This you inspired this cash." Well, I look at it and I go, "Wow, where, what cash was it, and where'd they get the inspiration from?" Because they'll take it, and run with it, and do so much better than I did. So, but you're exactly right. You're really just trying to, you know, get people's creative juices flowing. Well, and one of the things that really makes your gadget caches so uh, enticing isn't just the cool gadget caches, but the theming that you do around it. Because you'll have it in a location, and it matches that location. So talk a little bit about that and how you get those inspirations and make that happen. Well, uh, for example, I have a cache called Take a Deep Breath, and it uses a balloon. Uh, it gives you a drawer. You open a balloon. Well, uh, that was another Dayspring idea. Well, we work on it together, and the interesting thing with Dayspring, Dayspring says, "I've never, I've never built this because you know he's out still working, flying, um, flying jets all over the world." And so he says, I haven't built this, but once you, you've got more time, once you try it, well, I built it, but after I got it built, I didn't paint it. I really wanted to find out where it was going to go. Well, it ended up going at my local fire department. So I went and took a picture of the of their main fire engine here in Hedgesville, West Virginia. I painted the box now red and white to make it look like a fire department. I put a door you and put their decoupage, the picture of their engine. I took they were like engine company fifty one. I put a sign over top of the cache that says engine company fifty one. So I made it fit. So um the same thing with um, I have a cache at a State Farm uh, location. Well, State Farm collars are white and red, so I painted the cache white and red. Well, that's a, another thing. You can take that cache and paint it white and red. Now, I didn't stick State Farm stickers on it, but I told the guy inside he's welcome to do that. Well, he comes out and puts State Farm stickers on the back and on both sides, and it's painted white and red. Well, to, the county says that 2,000 people a day pass within five feet of that geocache, 2,000 people a day, and I haven't had a single problem with a muggle at that geocache because everybody thinks it's the state farm birdhouse, you know. Um, so uh, you can take caches and you can paint them uh, or kind of give them a theme and make them fit where they belong. And so instead of sticking out like a sore thumb, they fit perfectly. Uh, another one I have at Chick-fil-A. It's a gadget cache, so you got to pull something, push something, 
slide something, you know, and it's got all these things, and you've got to try to figure out what order to put it in. Well, after I got permission to put it at Chick-fil-A, I painted it white and put big black dots on it. So you can sit in the Chick-fil-A restaurant and in the winter when all the leaves are gone and you look out and you can see that geocache sitting right out in right out the corner of the parking lot. But it, it just looks like it was a chick you know, came from corporate Chick-fil-A. So uh, I, it, 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 I kind of theme it if I can to fit the fit the location. You can't always do that, but if you can, it works out great. Well, Team Pugach uh, makes a, a good point that you kind of already addressed, um, but he says he's seen pictures of the gadget caches that are, quote, advertising the business, for instance, the State Farm Insurance Birdhouse, but does that violate any of the uh, ground speak rules? Yeah, the uh, the one at State Farm is, is uh, called Widget, and uh, I didn't put those stickers on that. I painted that uh, cache white and red, and the cache owner... You know, at some later point, went out there and stuck that out there. Um, the one at Chick Fil A uh, does look like Chick Fil A, um, but I don't think Chick Fil A owns you know white with black spots. I doubt <laughs> you know if you take a white birdhouse and paint it white and put black spots on it uh, and stuck it at um, McDonald's, Chick Fil A, I don't think it's going to sue you. It's a good question. Uh, but I normally don't put the business name, you know, you, you're not allowed to put the business name on it. So I don't do that. I just happen to color, you know, I just happen to paint it so that it looks like it fits. Well, and of course, the cash page doesn't mention anything about its uh, host business. But we should also note, uh, for anyone who might uh, not realize, you mentioned the cash owner. And what you're really talking about is not yourself, which is what most people would uh, think of the cash owner as being but rather the landowner, the uh, business that's hosting that cash. Yes, that, that's correct. I, I said cash owner, but, um, yeah, I meant the one, the person hosting that cash. But you're, the only way you can – the only thing – you're not allowed to mention the business name. Um, the only way – if you look at any of my caches, sometimes I will say you can thank, you know um, – Dottie Doolittle at Chick-fil-A for allowing me to place this cash on their property. And that's the only way I have found that you can legally uh, mention the name, and that's by thanking the owner and giving them permit, you know, saying that you've got permission from that person. Because uh, that's the other thing about mine. Um, I go well beyond permission with mine, I kind of almost develop uh, relationships with some of my property owners, and um, I, um, I, I want the property owner, you, you know, not to only give me permission, but to kind of understand what the geocache is. Uh, a lot of times I'll go show them the app and show them how, you know, people are going to find it. Um, and then one of the things I almost always do is after uh, that cache has been out for three or four weeks, I almost always print out the, the cache page and the logs, and I take them back after three or four weeks and say, how's things going? Let me show you some of the logs that, I've, you know, that you've got here at your business. Um, I have a couple at a couple local markets, and those people are so appreciative of my cache there. Um, because you know, I have the same problem everyone else does all over the United States. When you start asking for permission to place a geocache, they look at you like you have three heads. What is geocaching? You know, what does this mean for me? Why do I want it here? And so I go through the whole spill and give them the normal spill we all give them. But then I go back, uh, especially when the cache is new, almost every three or four weeks, and just say, "How's things going?" Are there any problems? And I show them the logs. And a lot of our small businesses, a lot of the logs, on one of my caches at a local restaurant, some of my logs, people will even suggest what sandwich to buy inside their restaurant. Or uh, if they pick peaches at the orchard, they'll say, get the early girls or uh, you know the, bla the early blaze peaches. They're the best. Um, you know, so I'll take that back to the cash owner 
boy, you talking about having an impact on a cash owner. That that cash owner is really impacted by saying, wow, you care about me. You said you was going to come back. You really are. And then I show them the logs, and you know, I, I took some log backs last week, and the lady says, "Can I take these and share them with all my employees?" Because geocachers are a fabulous community, and a lot of times people will go in and thank the cash owner. I mean, the cash um, landowner. landowner. Yes, the landowner thanks, and they'll say, "Hey, thanks for allowing us to have that. You know, put that geocache there." Uh, our community really appreciates it, and they'll mention sometimes the owner by name. Uh, they'll even mention you know what to buy in the store, people that they met. Well, the cat, the cash, the landowner loves that. And then guess what? I mean, well, and give you a little history. Uh, I'm a I'm a graduate of Disney. Um, I'm a. They sent me to uh, you know my my corporate company before I retired years ago sent me to Disney University so I'm a graduate of Disney and, and I think it's that some of that customer service stuff I picked up at you know at Disney but uh, th they love that and that cash owner as they teach us at Disney is going to tell 20 other cash owners about geocaching I mean uh, 20 other business owners so when she goes to Rotary Club she's going to say do you have a geocache on your property. Um, you know, uh, some of my shops have been financially impacted with my get, you know, with my gadget caches, and they tell other shops. And so now I get calls. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I got a call a couple months ago from a local hotel, and she said, "Hey, um, I'm so and so. I own the so and so hotel." Are you the geocache guy? I said, Yeah, I'm the geocache guy. And she says, Well, we want one of those things on our on our hotel property. And I said, Well, thank you for calling me. Where are you at? I said, Let me just go jump in front of my computer. So she gave me her address. So I'm popping her up in geocaching.com, and I go, Oh, are you the hotel located right next to the Holiday Inn? She said, Yes. And I said, I'm sorry, I have a geocache at the Holiday Inn, and we have uh, saturation guidelines. I can only put them 528 feet apart. It doesn't look like I can put one there. The conversation went from being a, this is a really nice lady to this lady like, well, that's not fair. I want a geocache on my you know, hotel property. And so, uh, I mean, we, she was really aggravated that she couldn't have one of those things because she goes to Rotary Club, and people say, "Man, we're having people come over the weekend, and you know, uh, they're geocaching all weekend, and they're stopping here, right here, or they'll come here to get the geocache. It'll be nine o'clock, and they'll say, hey, we were just out by getting the geocache. We decided we're going to stay here.' Um, so, you know, these business owners talk to other business owners, and that's how you change the culture where you're living. I love that idea. And just to put my two cents in, I don't think painting a birdhouse, the colors of the business, is promoting the business. I consider it more camouflage. Yeah, I would uh, definitely if, agree with that. Yeah, I mean, if it's the same colors as the business, people look at it and go, oh, birdhouse for the business, no problem, and move on. Right. But those and who are best, not cashers. The best camouflage really is not about making it disappear, but making it blend in so it looks like it belongs. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. But I love the fact that you're making friendships really with the landowners and the business owners and saying hey if we put a cash here I'll come back and I'll show you what people are saying about it um, that's fabulous because then they see hey look I'm not doing anything and people are coming to my place of business because of some silly box sitting out there that I don't actually understand but it doesn't matter it's a form of advertisement that I'm getting now uh, at no cost Oh, absolutely, absolutely. In fact, our county just, there was an article just a couple weeks ago, our county had put out an article, uh, our Visitors Bureau for Berkeley County, and um, they have seen uh, over a $70,000 increase in hotel uh, uh, lodging revenues uh, over the past six or seven months, and they equated it to two things right in the top of the article. And guess what one of them was? Geocaching. So, so geocaching is filling up hotels in uh, Berkeley County. Wow. Um, so, you know, it didn't start this way. In fact, people at GeoWoodstock, you know, uh, halfway, you know, um, 
a couple of people came up and said, well, Cashing's not like in my place, you know, where I live, it's not like Berkeley County. Well, Berkeley County hasn't always been that way. I mean, it was like pulling teeth when I wanted to put the first geocache on city property. Um, I mean, it took it took a couple months of work to get the very first cache in city property. Um, and so Berkeley County is five years in the making, but but it's it, it really comes down to working with these businesses and these businesses talking to each other and seeing the value of it. But one of the things that I would encourage uh, geocachers everywhere to do is talk to your visitors bureau and find out how they're funded. Our our visitors bureau here in Berkeley County is funded by half they get 50% of the hotel tax. So, if you can do anything, I mean if you can by placing geocaches in a geo trail, if you can put it in such a way that it increases the hotel revenue, the hotel revenues, then that money goes right back into their pocket. So, we have a great relationship with our county here because they're funded by hotel um, tax revenues. So when I was putting together the gadget trail, I was brainstorming with the board of directors at Berkeley County and they're going, well, we really want to drive hotel revenues. I was thinking and the lady who is a muggle said, is there such a thing as a night cash? And I said, what? yes. I go, <laughs> yes, there is. This there is. And she goes, well, why don't we put a night cash on our trail so that they have to stay overnight? And I go, that's a great idea. I wish I had <laughs> thought of that. So uh, people always ask, why do you have a night cash on our gadget? On our, on our, um, it's called uh, Gadgets of Berkeley County. So a shameless commercial. Can I do a j shameless commercial? Oh, it's a GC, a GC 4X CH3 is the first cache on that, but Gadgets of Berkeley County. So it's you, have, you find 12 or 13, but the only mandatory cache is, guess what, the night cache. So uh, it, 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 you know, people normally cache all day, do the night cache at night, go back in the next day, and you know, claim their coin. Um, so it's a win-win. It's a win for me because people want to do all the gadget caches, and it's a win for the county. But our county is thrilled. And um, if you call uh, the Berkeley County Visitors Bureau, I'm sure Laura Gessler, who's the executive director there, would be happy to talk to any of the other geocachers, you know, all, all over the country to ha help them work with their visitors bureau to put out geo trails because they're spending the money on a coin, but they're getting big benefits in having people stay overnight. Well, and I imagine that for people looking to get uh, permission to hide that uh, first uh, cash, that first cool cash in a business uh, parking lot, uh, going back and grabbing one of your caches with all of these great logs and taking them in and say, look, this is what it's done in other places, might be a good way to approach that uh, business owner too. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I walked in a sandwich shop. I mean, I had – it took me like three visits. It was a very small sandwich shop, and I was, I, but it was a perfect location for a gadget cache. And so I was talking to this cash owner, and she said, well, you come back and talk to my husband. So I went back and talked to the husband. They go, well, let us talk about it. And I said, well, let me get you, you know, uh, I'll give you the email of a couple other local businesses. So on my third visit, I go back. She goes, okay, let's do it. And I said, well, if there's a problem and we need to move it, we can. Well, I went back in with my logs, you know, two weeks later, and that lady came across the room, and she goes, oh, my gosh. And here I went from – this person, she couldn't even remember my name, just saying, oh, my gosh, honey, I could just kiss you. And um, I go back in there, you know, every month or so, and she tells me, she says, on Saturday, probably 50% of our business are people that are here doing that geocache out in our backyard. But um, we put – uh, that's an Etch-A-Sketch, and it's a great cache. And, again, it has nothing to do with the business. But they have little outdoor tables 
that are only like 10 feet from my geocache. And she wanted to put it in a little flower garden. We mulched around it. I mean, it's just this beautiful little teeny garden, but the tables are sitting right there where you eat. And so guess what people do? They walk up, they grab the Etch-A-Sketch. Well, that cache takes about five, ten minutes to try to figure out how to open the lock. And so because you're turning this Etch-A-Sketch right a half turn, left half turn, you know, twice around right. So you're spelling out a number on an Etch-A-Sketch that's going to give you the combination to the lock. So that it's not a parking grab is my point. They're there for 10 or 15 minutes. Well, guess what they're doing for that 10 or 15 minutes? They go in, they buy a sandwich, they buy drinks, the kids go in and buy snacks. Um, you know, so that it, it's a great thing for that business, and that business owner talks to other business owners, uh, and that's how you change the culture in your town. Well, great information and great uh, insight, but we are getting a little bit long here, so we have one question uh, left in the live Q&A uh, from JR and Juju about uh, some logistics, and they want to know if all of your caches are premium caches. Yes, I make all of mine premium caches. Uh, I've just got too much money invested in mine um, just to put them out. I, I've tried a couple times to put out caches that aren't premium, but I end up, um, you know, I've ended up with problems, and you still end up problems with premium. But normally, premium members aren't your newbie. Because a newbie can walk up to a birdhouse and they'll take a screwdriver or something to it, you know, and that can happen with a premium member, correct, right? But I make all my premium members, I just feel a little safer because um, probably I have well over a thousand dollars on the gadgets of Berkeley County. And then I have a new trail out, Mystery Caches of Berkeley County, and it's the same thing. I probably have, you know, well over a thousand dollars and so I make him premium member that makes sense and hopefully that's uh, worked well for you sounds like it has yep it has so yes yeah, for the more complex uh, caches it makes sense that you need to uh, limit the access and you know a lot of people complain that the accounts are just too easy to sign up for and you get the vandals who will uh, sign up for the free account but you don't get uh, the vandals paying for that year so that's an, another factor that uh, some people have run into yeah there is there is no way you can prevent a cash from being stolen I mean if they want it they're going to get it right um, but one of the things I always do if I can if I can I try to put it on my own 4x4 four four post and when I mount my gadget caches I mount them with four different types of screws the you know Phillips uh, slot uh, I'll use a square and a star and so if somebody comes they're either going to have to take a chainsaw and cut my you know four by four down which they can do very easily and quickly and be gone in a minute or they're going to have to come prepared with at least four or five different kinds of bits because mine are you know I try to only thing I'm trying to do is deter theft you can't stop it very true well, thanks again for uh, all of the great insight, and hopefully you've inspired some people and given them some more information to actually go out and get the uh, permission, because that's a big part of this is getting the permission to do that. Yes, absolutely. I, you know, I, th I, th we all it gives caching a bad name if we put out a cache without permission. And I know I find caches all the time, and I go, "There's no way this person got permission," because I asked for permission here, and the guy said no. I <laughs> mean, and there's a cache there now. So. Uh, permission, I think, is important, but I, if you really want to change the culture where you're living, go past permission and go to building a relationship with your folks. Yeah, that can uh, definitely prevent some nasty standoffs too. But well, and it, it makes it nice when you cash when you're caching because you you show up there, you're almost welcome and wanted. I mean, people mm -hmm. know. They're expecting you. It's almost like you sent out an invitation. And so when my owners see a person there, uh, they go, oh, they're there getting the geocache. Uh, a lot of times if they're sticking their head in the bush, they'll go, oh, I remember I told somebody they could stick a piece of Tupperware in that bush. Uh, my, you know, my folks, uh, they know what they're there for, and they're, they're welcomed. And a lot of times some of my owners will walk out 
and say, "Hey, you need a hint? You know, can I help you?" I mean, it's pretty uh, it's pretty insulting when you get a muggle to give you a hint on some of my caches, <laughs> but I have muggles giving out hints lots of times on some of mine. Very, very cool. All right, so we've already mentioned the uh, uh, Gadget Cash channel, and we'll, of course, link to that in the show notes. Is there anything else that you want to uh, give folks before we take off on uh, uh, the, how to get some inspiration or what's happening in uh, your neck of the woods? Well, the latest, uh, the latest, th th we have a second Gadget Cash trail. It's called Mystery Caches of Berkeley County, and that um, GC number is GC5QPM. That, uh, no, P, uh, MJ, it's a PMJ, but it's Mystery Caches of Berkeley County. Um, so there's two gadget tr cache trails out here in Berkeley County now, and you can earn a coin on both, and they're beautiful coins. And I guess my profile page has all kinds of information. It even re uh, has a link back to uh, the Beta 41, Daryl. Uh, so uh, it's got all the information uh, that you would need, and they can, if they're a cache builder, they're welcome to go to my gadget cash channel and hopefully get some ideas and I keep posting things I'm just not real good about doing it but every month or so I try to put a new new gadget cash out I'm a new gadget cash video out so thanks for having me I appreciate that oh thank you we have one more bit of Q&A this one uh, comes in it says my or Mr. Tim my geo name is DJT cool in Statesboro Georgia and you're my geo idol and a lot of inspiration for me. So there you go. You're somebody's geo idol. Wow. Thank you very much. That's that, <laughs> that's so nice. I'm telling you, we got a great geocaching community. Don't we though? Yeah, we really do. Well, here at Geo Gearheads, we have a community as well. And we call it our patrons. So just a quick word to our patrons. The names have gone your names have gone to GX Proxy for the Travel Bug Race. We'll be sharing the more of this uh, as the release approaches. So keep an eye for the announcements through Patreon. In the meantime, barring any issues, I'll be releasing those travelers at the block party. If you'd like to grab yours for release from the block party, let me know and I'll set it aside. So to all our listeners, please stop by our booth and grab one of these travelers and help it along its way. Um, all they want to do is get to a Travel Bug Hotel in the UK. So dropping them in the Travel Bug hotels near the airports can be really helpful. But if nothing else, swing by the booth and say hi to Wits End, Land Monkey, and even me. Well, last week's topic is about the uh, Needs Archived logs stirred up some real interest, so we'll be talking more about it in next week's Randomized show as well. We'd like your input for that show, and that's going to be your ticket to a prize from CoinsAndPins.com. Send your email to geogearheads at cashamaniacs.com with the subject question 188. In the body, include your geocaching.com screen name and tell us just yes or no as to whether you would use a needs archive log or, well, not. If you're up, to, uh, if you're up for it, also let us know why and under what circumstances it would be appropriate. That's optional, but extra information might make it into the show and shape that conversation. So it's an easy one as anyone who answers, and there's no right or wrong answers, of course, it's, as long as it's yes or no, uh, gets their name dropped into that drawing. So send us your email at geogearheads at cashamaniacs.com with the subject of question 188 for your chance at that prize from coinsandpins.com. Thanks again to coinsandpins.com for the prize and to you for sharing your opinions. So, Daryl, you can't send in a, well, it depends, answer. No, no, not this time. <laughs> now it has to be a yes or no. Now, Daryl has been working hard at scheduling shows, and he's got shows scheduled well beyond what I'm reading here. So, August 6th, that's just next week. We already talked about it. It's a randomized show. August 13th, we're talking about caching electronics. August 20th is benchmarking. August 27th is going caching 2015. And... September 3rd is Road Caching 6. That's going to be a good one. Check the Cashamaniacs website at cashamaniacs.com for more on the GeoGear has including show notes for this and all our episodes. We love hearing from our listeners, so leave us feedback by calling 206-350-3647 by emailing geogearheads at cashamaniacs.com or through social media. Your support helps keep the Cashamaniacs shows coming. 
Please consider becoming a patron through the link on our website to support the Cash Maniac shows. Geo Gear has is produced by Chris Huffenauer and Daryl Wanberg. This show is copyright 2015 by Daryl Wanberg. All rights reserved. Thank you.